<laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> now look sharp. We're being recorded. Um, <laughs> no more jokes. No more pets. Um, so I'll start. Uh, um, J'ai seulement la la biographie de uh, Adam et de Emma en anglais. Uh, donc, je vais la lire en anglais, uh, mais uh, le créer est quand même un espace bilingue. Donc, si vous voulez poser des questions, faire une intervention en français, uh, je, Emma parle français, uh, Adam, je ne sais pas. Uh, on peut faire la traduction instantanée sans problème. Uh, donc, c'est uh, un espace uh, bilingue, uh, mais j'ai seulement la présentation uh, des auteurs en anglais, uh, de l'auteur et uh, de Emma. On anglais. So, uh, Adam Barker is a settler Canadian from the territories of uh, the Odenoshone and Anishinaabe people near Hamilton, Ontario. He holds a PhD in human geography from the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom and currently works as a research assistant in the Department of Geography at the University of Sheffield. His most recent book, which we'll be discussing today, is uh, Making and Breaking Settler Space, and it was recently released by UBC Press. Emma Battle-Lohman is a settler Canadian and British scholar raised in the Niagara region of Ontario. She holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Warwick and currently holds numerous teaching and research positions, including at the University of Leicester and with Yellowhead Tribal College in Edmonton. She has published on, published on diverse topics, including indigenous language literacy in 19th century British Columbia, the settler colonialism of the Canadian justice system and settler decolonization work. Adam and Emma jointly authored the 2015 book Settler Colonialism and Identity in 21st Century Canada, uh, which has been widely used in Canadian higher education. Uh, and so with uh, this introduction, as I said, we some of us had participated in a reading group around making and breaking settler space. Uh, so some of us have read the book, some of us um, haven't. And so I found my copy. Uh, there it is. <laughs> and without further introduction, I'll invite uh, Adam uh, to take it from here. Thank you very much, Jan. I first want to express my sincere thanks at being asked to come and do this discussion. Uh, it, this is the kind of thing that when you're you're in the depths of writing a book, you're you're really looking forward to these chances to you know, continue to work with the ideas with engaged people. Um, and in the back of your mind, you're always wondering, is anyone ever actually gonna read this? So the fact that about a half dozen people definitely have really, really makes me feel very touched, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to uh, thank you also for welcoming um, Emma along uh, with me here. Emma is, um, as, as she often tells people, uh, my, my partner in scholarship and life, uh, we we work together all the time. Uh, we have for many many years, and it would I, I honestly think it's it's all, almost dishonest for me to discuss this work without her input because she's such a big part of it. Um, for uh, as as Yan mentioned, I am a I'm a geographer. Um, I previous to doing my PhD, I did my master's in indigenous governance with a, a background in political theory, uh, and moved into geography to try and pick up some of the spatial tools, theoretical tools to help me continue my research. Emma's a historian and sociologist, and so she brings those perspectives to uh, our work. And we try to, when we approach issues of settler colonialism, we try to do them holistically rather than uh, instrumentally, as it were. Um, so the book itself, uh, which I am, again, very, very grateful that people have read, uh, started its life as my PhD thesis. So one of the things that's, uh, that I wanted to mention first of all was that the scholarship of this book was rooted as much in anything else uh, in my own experiences of trying to bridge the gap between my intellectual understandings of settler colonialism as, as a theory, as a process, as something that occurs historically, and my own being as a person of a settler society. Um, it was not accidental that that research was primarily conducted from the UK. Back in 2009, when we first moved here, part of what we wanted to do was to study settler colonialism in an environment where uh, the affective aspects, the you know, emotional entanglements of it, were at a slightly further remove. Um, and of course, immediately found out that there was no way that we could get away from that entirely because we brought our own you know, affective entanglements with us, we discovered that moving out of a settler society, out of a settler state, didn't make us any less settlers. 
Uh, but it did, I think, encourage me to try to think simultaneously very, very broadly about what is settler colonialism? What does it mean to the places that I'm from and that I care about? And also the flip side of that, the things that I care about, the things that make me who I am, how are they entangled with settler colonialism? Because I wanted to start from a premise, not something that I say directly in the book, but I think something that really ideologically influenced how I approached to this research was that I'm, I'm not exceptional, right? especially in the years following uh, you know, the rise of things like Idle No More, terms like settler and settler colonialism have become far, far more commonly used. Uh, being an early adopter, I can't even claim to be an innovator because to me, I picked up the term from Paulette Reagan, um, from Patrick Wolf, from those people who were writing before I, you know, when I was still an undergrad. So, my coming to understand what it meant to be a settler person in Canada uh, was simultaneously um, unusual because, you know, previous to, um, you know, when I was, I was started to do this research, there, there was not a lot of discussion about that. It's certainly not, at least in my social circles, not in my family, not in, um, you know, kind of my friendship groups. Uh, and so I, I felt like I was in a position of having you know, one foot in this kind of strange, slightly out there reality. But at the same time, I hadn't really done anything and there, or there weren't any particular, uh, you know, accomplishments I could point to to say, ha, look, this is how I got here. It almost happened by accident, just as I went through, you know, my education. Um, as an undergraduate, I didn't go to university intending to study Indigenous studies. I was <laughs> in about my second month of my undergraduate, um, I was grabbed by an instructor named Sylvia Bowerbank, and I think I mentioned her briefly in the book, who grabbed me and took me off to the Indigenous Studies office and just went, enroll him. <laughs> and that was the beginning of a long series of especially Indigenous women scholars telling me what to do, and me going, yeah, that is a good idea. I think I'll do that, <laughs> which has led me progressively down the road to um, essentially not, not even just studying settler colonialism but in trying to combine intellectual analysis and lived experience of trying to dismantle settler colonialism and trying to live a life that's oriented towards indigenous sovereignties and indigenous self-determination as a settler person. So with that being the fundamental goal, getting to a place where, you know, as a settler person, I can find a way to live my life politically, socially, and culturally in a way that supports indigenous self-determination, nationhood, uh, and sovereignty, rather than supporting settler colonial uh, story, story systems and structures, that I first had to sort of pick apart all of those entanglements and all those, those, those bits of me that are caught up with settler colonialism, all the bits of settler colonialism that are caught up with me. So the way that the, the book ended up being organized was almost scalar in nature. I wanted to start from big geographies and big time periods back into you know, the, the imperial uh, adventures into Turtle Island and into the quote unquote new world from the earliest inception and how that laid the groundwork for some of the bases of settler uh, colonization as a strategy, but also as a defining point of a society. And then to start to drill down into how that society, how that culture, how those nations, you know, there are multiple nations of settler people, how, how they developed over time in tension with each other, in conflict with indigenous people, in tension with other structures of power, uh, you know, whether it be uh, overseas imperialism, whether, whether it be capitalism, um, whether it be the state, right? These, these, these ways of organizing, political economies that exist around the world, but that are also very, very specific in settler colonial contexts. So then once looking at that society, that's when I wanted to start then drilling down a little bit even further and looking at how specific groups within settler societies uh, do or don't organize around settler colonial norms and ideologies. And that's where I found it particularly instructive to look at activism, 
uh, and social justice and social change movements, especially those that try to identify themselves as having an anti-colonial or a pro-Indigenous, whatever that means, interest in their activism. And in so doing, reveal their, their many shortcomings, the ways that they failed, not to finger wave at activists, but rather to try to disrupt the assumptions that certain parts of the political spectrum or certain activist uh, movements, tactics, strategies, things like that are inherently anti-settler colonial or you know, in, uh, in promotion of indigenous self-determination and sovereignty. Um, and that was where the door opened to finally kind of come back to my own experiences and using my intellectual and emotional struggles, the head and heart struggles to come to grips with settler colonialism as a strategic exemplar. Because I'm, you know, I am not exceptional. I have attempted to engage in uh, anti-colonial activism throughout my life. Most of it has failed, right? So when I'm when I'm talking about the failures of other activists, just as when I'm talking about the settler colonialism of other Canadians, I don't exempt myself from any of that, right? I have failed as an activist. I have upheld settler colonialism in my life. And uh, the, the goal was to say, it's all got to be for something. We've, you know, these, these failures have to be productive failures. Uh, I'm, I was really taken with Halberstam's uh, low theory of failure. And the, the determination more than anything else to say, just because something isn't successful by the way that uh, it might be uh, judged to be successful from an exterior position doesn't mean it hasn't changed anything. And sometimes the change itself is, is the point. So as anybody who studies activist movements knows, the vast majority of activist movements don't achieve their goals. But what they often do is make changes in terms of relationality or you know, the distribution of power, things like that, that allow more opportunities to open up on the other side of that change. Uh, and as Sidney Tarot, the social movement theorist long ago noted that people don't respond to years of oppression and injustice in terms of springing to their feet and, and becoming active. They respond to the perception that there's an opportunity to change something. And so what I wanted to do in drilling down to that very, very individual level, that affective level, was to use that low theory of failure to disrupt the hegemonic and dominating narrative uh, that portrays the settler colonial assemblage as totalizing, as complete, as having already been successful, and as inescapable. So I, I ended up on trying to think about how we can build stronger relationships and alliances between settler people who want to decolonize and indigenous communities in struggle with the real challenge being that failure is inescapable to a certain extent for settler people. But our failures have to be almost expected and planned in a way that they don't um, undermine the efforts of indigenous communities that we're seeking to support. And there's tons and tons of examples of exactly that sort of thing happening. Um, for example, uh, I very recently had an amazing opportunity to speak with uh, two Indigenous women activists. Um, they, they don't define themselves as activists, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a misspeak on my part. Um, again, Yenge Haga woman and um, Wet'suwet'en woman, both engaged in land defense and uh, land reclamation. And in the activist circles that they work in, they are part of uh, these in Indigenous-led movements to reclaim land on indigenous territories and where there are significant numbers of non-indigenous actors attempting to support those movements. And after many, many discussions, what we came to was a long list of all the different ways that uh, radical activists were, were essentially failing indigenous communities and making things worse or harder in their struggles. And the, the story that, that sticks with me at this point was the militant radical activist who was involved, a white settler radical activist who was involved in um, 
the 1492 Land Back Lane reclamation ongoing outside of Six Nations of the Grand River, who was eventually asked to leave the community because he was his presence was so antagonistic to the police that it both brought the possibility of more violence onto the community, but it also, in the eyes of outside authorities, made it look like he was the one in charge rather than the actual Indigenous community organizers, right? So that's an example of a failure that actually undermined that movement. And that's the thing that we need to avoid. And instead, what I landed on was uh, essentially the idea of settlers having to in relationship, always in relationship with Indigenous communities, organize and, conf and confront settler colonialism primarily in their own communities, right? Is it necessary for us settlers to be on the front line of every land reclamation, or is it perhaps more useful for us to be in our schools, in our churches, at our family reunions, talking to people about what is going on and what is wrong, and trying to build different kinds of relationships. And inevitably in that, we will often fail, but that is a failure that can produce more generative possibilities for relating differently on the other side of that failure without necessarily impacting negatively on indigenous communities. But of course it has to be linked to a political project. I don't want to um, imply that I'm advocating uh, endless talking without action, but that the action and the politics have to be determined by the relationship to and the orientation towards the indigenous community, while the responsibility is towards the settler community, the responsibility to try and change, the, the, the responsibility to try and act, not just in moments of crisis, but in moments where there is an opportunity to speak, right? So settler radical anarchist activists on the front lines of a land reclamation antagonizing police is probably a lot less helpful than you know sitting down with your parents your brother your your co-workers and saying we need to talk about what's going on and what we are going to do about it um so i don't know if i achieved my goal fully in the book uh of outlining um some ethical precepts for for approaching relationships and behaving in relationships that can support a uh, a political movement for decolonization um, that doesn't end up being uh, either sabotaged by settler failure or overdetermined by settler uh, perceptions of what is necessary and what is decolonization. Mm. Um, partly because I don't think that's a doable project in a general sense. The specificity of the relationship to indigenous communities is really, really important. And I think that one of the things that was really brought home to me through the course of doing this research and what I learned while I was doing it was I need to ground myself in the communities where I have relationships. And so one of the things that I have been doing following this book, and it's one of the things I'm always interested in when, when I read a book, is what, what, did, what, what came next? What did you do next? Is I've been working really hard to go back to those territories that I'm originally from, especially. Um, so that means the, the Niagara Peninsula, the Haldeman Tract, um, you know, the Golden Horseshoe area. So they're like all the different names for those kind of like overlapping spaces. And on one hand, really reconnect with my, my friends in the community there to find out what their needs are right now. Because you can relate to a certain extent across difference and technology is great for that. But there's all kinds of little things that you only hear in extended conversations or that only become apparent while you're working alongside people in a community. And, and I don't mean working necessarily to, you know, to put up barricades or something like that. I mean, you know, making a meal together. One of, one of the best things I did the last time I was in Ontario was um, going up to Six Nations and just having brunch with a couple of friends that turned into, you know, a five hour long talk and a tour of the reclamation site, right? And the other thing being to exercise that responsibility in that place where I have derived so much of my personal privilege and benefit of being a settler person. It comes literally right from those lands. It comes from the lands that, uh, you know, have been exploited so that there could be, you know, wealth in an economy that my family came from Britain and joined, right? They would not have gone to that place and they would not have stayed there and they would not have achieved a middle-class suburban lifestyle if all that dispossession 
had not happened and continued to happen, mm -hmm. right? So in identifying those very, very specific relationships that I need to exercise my own theory through, um, I've, I've found a couple of very specific things that now I and we are, are trying to pursue in that territory that we think will help, but they are certainly not, without going into too much detail, you know, the things that I would have expected when I was a much younger person, when my activism was still based around the idea of, um, not to be uh, uh, too on the nose, but uh, wanting to be that that white savior to a certain extent, wanting that ego boost of being victorious and having to take your ego out of it so that yeah. you can accept the necessity of failure fundamentally changes your horizons of what you, you want to achieve and how you strategize to achieve it. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, this, this book is an attempt to intellectualize some of my humbling experiences, some of my many, many humbling experiences that I have had, and to spend time thinking through them, uh, not without the emotion, not without the impact and the, on, on you know, my own sense of self and things like that, but trying to hold those two things together, understanding why certain things made me feel awful when if I step back from it and I look at the interaction, I'm in favor of the interaction. That made sense, right? So when I found those places where there was a mismatch between my emotional reaction and my intellectual analysis, that was a place where I wanted to pause and consider. That's one of those things that um, I refer to as the uncertain edges of settler colonialism. Because settler colonialism so often functions under the assumption that we are all just going to treat it as normal and that it is extremely difficult to convince someone who is immersed in a settler colonial society and culture that it even exists, right? Settler colonialism, I will never forget, an indigenous student in Thunder Bay told me once um, that she told one of her professors she wanted to research a, a topic in the context of settler colonialism, and the professor said, that sounds like a conspiracy theory, right? The, just basically dismissing the idea of settler colonialism entirely. But when you have two diametrically opposed reactions, one intellectual and one emotional, that tells you that something's going on that's incoherent. There's, there's a lever being pulled somewhere. And so I think of that as those are the moments where you can see your own immersion in that assemblage and you can <clears throat> feel parts of the assemblage trying to move you in a direction. But at the end of the day, you also have to want to be moved. Right. That's that's sort of the nature of how people and assemblages interact is that the conditions are created for things to move a certain way. It's not necessarily a matter of, um, you know, conscripting people into some invasion force. Um, it's the quotidian and the everyday more often than not uh, repeating and repeating and repeating until it becomes seen as normal. So. When I found things in my research that made me you have a little emotional flinch, that's what I looked at the hardest. That's where the focus on Occupy came from. So Occupy occurred during the early part of my PhD studies. And I mean, some of the, some people I really, really like were big supporters, David Graeber, uh, I really like his work. And, and he, was, um, he was a big advocate of Occupy. And I wanted to really, really like it. And I, I defended it against a, you know, a lot of early critiques um, I, I do believe that there was a, a fairly uh, anarchic character at the core of it and that there was a great deal of potential to cause change there. Um, the failures of it to achieve what it said it was going to achieve as a movement are, as we'd said earlier, unsurprising. Activist movements all, almost never do. But what was surprising was the degree of animosity towards Occupy from a lot of my Indigenous friends when I first started talking to them about it. And that's when I said, right, I've got to look into this. If I'm such a big fan of it and these folks aren't, what's going on? And that's when I started to unearth those, you know, stories of all of the different kinds of, um, you know, settler colonialism and white supremacy at the core of a lot of the Occupy movement among people who, by their own stated intent, wouldn't do that sort of thing, right? So we're looking at what's obviously here, um, like, a, like a mass trend within uh, a movement where individuals do not intend to do it, but it happens anyway. So uh, as I said, th that was an emotional reaction for me that I wanted to defend this movement and believe in it, but what it was doing was demonstrably still settler colonial. And once 
I realized that. That was probably the biggest turning point in the research was realizing that I also had to let go that settler colonialism was something that really only belonged on one end of the spectrum, the political spectrum that is. Mm -hmm. So this book was researched alongside um, uh, articles uh, in journals where I was, I was doing some more specific and focused work on Occupy and also on anarchist activists uh, and how they uphold settler colonialism. And that's one of the, the big fundamental points in the book is that political allegiances and ideologies are not enough to escape settler colonialism because it is so deeply affective and it does exist in relationships between people, between people and the places that they consider their places. It operates partly through things like our senses of belonging and senses of self in those places. And that's not something that you can necessarily just argue somebody out of, right? You have to have uh, emotional affective connections with people so that you can have intellectual conversations, but also work on the, the heart at the same time. If you say to somebody, hey, settler colonialism is genocidal, it's bad. They're like, yeah, I know, I hate it. And then you say, so that thing that you're doing that's very settler colonial, they're like, hey, right? <laughs> that's, that kind of reaction shows you that you're at a rather critical moment. Um, and it's one of the things that I see as a, a huge red flag not that there's something wrong with any individual or even with a movement, but that settler colonization is operating in a very specific way here. And that means we have an opportunity to expose it. And so often uh, exposing settler colonialism in operation is absolutely essential to then being able to do something about it. So that's sort of my brief overview of the research of where it came from. Uh, I would like to stop there to be able to turn this over to have a bit of a conversation about it. Um, and oh, uh, <laughs> before before we do that, um, how about I bring in uh, my own personal reviewer too for a moment <laughs> to add a few words of context. To the number of viewer too. Ti bonjour, sofa. I just I just wanted to chime in as someone who's had. Um, the, the the privilege and challenge of seeing the long birthing process of this work and i think one of the things that's uh, certainly uh adam and i currently live and work in the uk and in the united kingdom's uh university systems and here there's a very regimented uh sort of approach to publishing this idea mm -hmm. that you must publish you know probably a book and uh three really big articles at least two every five years to sort of maintain your position and one of the things I like is that this, this book, Adam gave it time. It, I mean, lots happened in our lives, some, some challenging upheavals, but I think it really benefited from that process. And that speaks as well to the importance of the scholarly um, activist and also sort of affective communities we're part of, who've been part of talking through the work, part of giving feedback and support all the way along. And what, like Adam said, I, I come to the work from a slightly different um, sort of disciplinary understanding, although I would say we're both, both probably primarily rooted in interdisciplinary studies because yeah. of our undergraduates and indigenous resurgence. Yeah. Because so that, that's a kind of STEM. Adam's developed a geography leaf and I've kind of gone history and sociology. But I, so reading it from that vantage point, I mean, I really find this to be like a dynamic anatomy of the spaces and the spatial construction of settler colonialism. Like Adam said, they're the, the, the sort of doings on the land um, is an important area, I think, actually of interconnection between the academy and our efforts in, in, in with at least one foot in some of these spaces to address these issues. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the ontologies, priorities and values of indigenous uh, peoples on in the places we call home. So it's an important area, but the spatial is, it's, it, it can be intentional, it can be sort of new or aggressive, it can be quotidian, like Adam said that every day. And so I think that by, by dynamic anatomy, I think we've, we, we go through the scales and, and it's, it, partly um, with these very, very big challenges and big issues, occasionally big theory and low theory. But I, I like that, you know, as an author, Adam gives us a little something to hold on to. Um, so we can, you know, for example, in my own sort of, I, I can shift between focusing on the, the intellectual if I'm feeling a little too emotionally, eh, or I can follow his story. And using, you know, I think it is, um, it's consistent with I think what we generally accept is the practice in this area of, of research that it is not just research, it right. is not just 
producing knowledge for the sake of knowledge production and understanding things better, there needs to be some connection to action. And I think that's one of the challenging things about writing in this area yeah. is, you know, how can we convey that? How can we motivate and support at the same time as we're doing really difficult critical work? And I think, I think Adam would, uh, and, and well, both of us would be really interested in, you know, the responses. Does this kind of writing work for you? Does, mm -hmm. it, does it accomplish those multiple goals? And in, and I like this idea, this busting of binaries. We know binary thinking really works to support, um, you know, systems of marginalization and domination. Settler colonialism is no different. Yeah. So by taking out what I think uh, Tuck and Yang in their very important article, um, which is, oh my God, decolonization is not, not a, a metaphor. metaphor. Oh, um, these these sort of moves to innocence. So yeah. the idea that we could, you know, me, I could I could escape discomfort or any sort of you know actual complicity in in some of these large structural you know devastating processes by adopting a particular political position or uh, or even a performative political position. Mm -hmm. um, I think I feel like on the map it's we're chasing down these dynamics so that we can, like Adam said, identify those places of opportunity. Um, you know, Leonard Cohen said, there's a crack in everything, that's where the light gets in. And I think what I appreciate is, is you know, Adam hasn't tried to say, this is, this is the definitive work on settler colonialism. But no, he's, he's trying to break open some cracks with the idea that everything that comes next will break them open even further. So that's what I think. Thank you very much. Right, so very happy to have any kind of discussion that folks here would like. Um, chat. Yeah, uh, yeah. Verbally, whatever we can works. respond verbal or to chat, that's fine. I'm going to ask, uh, thank you very much for the, the presentation. I'm going to ask Valerie if you can stop the, the recording for the question period so people feel, feel more comfortable.